You're listening to 17 Karat K-Pop. For more about this show, as well as my other podcast, How to Stand, visit 17karatkpop.weebly.com. There you'll find episode guides, as well as additional reading, more exclusive content, tons of great stuff. And never miss an update, an album review, interview, etc. by subscribing to the free newsletter, howtostand.substack.com. You could also become a paying subscriber on Substack, and that means you're supporting an independent creator and become part of a community, howtostand.substack.com. Enjoy the show! Hi everybody! Welcome back to 17 Karat K-Pop. I am so, so psyched because 17's new album, Face the Sun, is finally here. I really am just freaking out. I'll try to keep my super freak out for after the show. But let me tell you, I am just, this is my Christmas, okay? Because there is so much I want to say about this release, I decided to try to break down my thoughts into 17 categories. So, in no particular order, here's what I thought about this comeback. 17 things worth noting about it. Details you may have missed, moments of appreciation for certain details, etc. Number one. In the press conference, 17 talked about this being their first album without any unit songs. And then they forgot, oh yeah, Hengare, but aside from that, this is new for them. Number two. They said they want the audience to pay close attention to the black diamond rings they wear. Actually, they gave kind of a TMI detail that Junhan actually started wearing his black ring way too early, requiring them to do some reshoots, so clearly it's a big Easter egg of sorts. Number three, the silver rings, though. Those are still there, too. Remember before I brought up how Soon Guan in Not Alone is wearing it, we see Junhan in a close-up wearing it in Pinwheel, and now Wan Wu for this comeback. Which brings me to number four, Wan Wu's character in all of this. Like I touched on in the episode called Face the Sun Theories, Wan Wu has such a pivotal role here. He got the final teaser video with the close-up of the ring, surrounded by the street signs, in front of sand dunes, the sun shining behind him, all the symbolism come together for him. And so in hindsight, now it's like, oh my gosh, Wanwu has been a key character in their whole music video universe for a long time. Because remember, the target images surrounded him in Hit, and then he was put in that electric fence archway thing. He got the first close-up in Fear. The SWAT team basically charged towards him in Happy Ending. Wanwu is the character who read the letter on the train in Home Run. He's one of the two who was associated with the core symbol of the Ready to Love video, those two phone booths. He's the one sunlight shines down on in the trauma video for quite a juxtaposition there. He's one of the characters who gets the diamond in Home Run until the eight distracts him and grabs it. He's the one holding up this Rubik's Cube and getting closer and he's in what looks like a police interrogation room. He gets tangled up in the eight in Hoshi's web in Fallen Flower, somehow gets tangled up in the ropes that bind them. So he's had a big role. And now in this new video, it seems super notable that he steps on a pair of glasses and then looks up and the next thing you know, we see a flock of black birds overhead. Which brings me to number five, the presence of birds in that video. Because remember, that dove was there for a second in the highlight video, which was really significant. And now it's back to being symbolic. It was part of the birdcage-themed Junhan individual teaser. But now in the hot video, instead of white birds, black birds. Number six, what June wears and what he carries. In the highlight medley, he has a white flag. He also holds a flag up in hot. And during anyone promo, he wore a shirt saying, to love yourself is a long life. And now he wears a sweater that says mastermind. So I don't know, it feels like his thing is sending messages through his outfits. Number seven, the highlight medley. It brings back a lot of symbols worth noting. And just has moments I think do tie into their larger story in ways we covered, breaking down all the symbols that have recurred throughout their work in the Face the Sun Theories episode of 17 Talk. But we see that Vernon is the character who stares into a mirror during Shadow. He opens up one of two identical doors he could have chosen. Joshua, like in Ready to Love, is by the traffic lights. Mingyu, like in his teaser video, is once again the one to pull back the curtains, literally and metaphorically. 
And, like in Pinwheel, Junhan is seen with his silver ring on in that highlight medley. Next notable detail, all the nods to previous symbols in the hot music video. There's the sand we talked about before, sand cover rooms before. There's the time, countdown clock and stuff before. Now in the new video, the eight lies on a giant clock. The smoke coming out of Vernon's mouth made me think of the smoke he inhaled from that flower on fire in fear. In this new video, the eight is in a narrow hall alone, stuck alone trapped just like in the video for home. Obviously, the flame symbol is still abundant. The blindfold, more symbols keep showing up again. The most eye-catching to me was Esku when he rubs his face and so it has like red smears on it. Presumably blood, I guess? It just made me think of the Fear music video when Jun Han smears the red lipstick across his face in very dramatic fashion. It also seems like they really intended for that moment to catch your eye because that's also when Esku releases a bird into the sky. Next thing I want to note I think it's very commendable and interesting how they often interact with the camera. We've talked about this a bit on previous Seventeen talks, but they really do. It's a way of looking at the camera, reacting to the camera, or making the camera look like it reacted to them, or controlling the members' movements, and they continue to kind of have sway over the direction in real time of the story, in Hot, where we see them reach toward the screen, basically, and grab that coin. Kind of like the diamond in Home Run, thrown between members in different scenes, now a coin is the way they reach each other. Next up, Soon Guan is back in a suit and tie. This seems notable because he was back in that, in that box, in 24 hours. The video, 24 hours. Now he's trapped again in this so-called concrete maze in a narrow hall alone with a suit and tie, and it just, to me, could represent something about his fears and insecurities regarding growing up, having to go out into the world as an adult now, and his lingering insecurities with that. Sonically, I want to note that this is very new for them, kind of. In some ways, I love that it is classically 17, the ad-libs, the genre blending, but it's also different because I'm used to with them a huge intro, like a drum roll, a crashing cymbal or something, and a dramatic phase out. Dramatic intros and conclusions, as well as dramatic bridges. This time they kind of skirted all of that in favor of just quick, fast-paced songs. Instead of songs with kind of chapters to them, intros, exposition, outros, it's just fast-paced. One song starts, then it ends, and the next one starts right away. No transitions. No grand finale. And they do have more instrumental-only bridges and other moments, I think, than usual. So they're just structurally marked differences in their songs. In a good way, they keep it fresh, but it's also still classically them. I also think they impressively did a lot with little details. They made pretty banal details meaningful, not just random. For example, each song pretty much ends right away, maybe one or two seconds between songs. Except Shadow, which has an extended period of like five seconds, extended compared to the others, of silence at the very end. That moment of silence is a core example of what I'm talking about. That this album is full of details that would be overlooked if they were commonplace, but because they're abnormal, it draws attention to those songs, and I just found that to be a very smart and creative way to tell their story. The album ending, really notable, because the last song on the album, Ash, ends with the line, For You. Their last album started with the song, To You. I know, mind blown. Number 14. Some of their past quotes really hit different now. They feel oddly like a premonition now. Here's something Wan Wu said during promoting Bittersweet. Quote, We've been preparing the land with fertilizer for the past six years, and I think now, with the seeds planted, all that's left is to grow. Now, we've just started to get just the right amount of water and sun. The only thing left to do now is to blossom, unquote. He brought up the album premise months and months and months ago, facing the sun and growing into new people, starting a new chapter of life. Then here's an interesting prior comment of Esku's. Quote, 
The wider you set your sights, the less you look up at the sky. I ended up seeing all the things around me, and I think it's the same for the others too. A love that isn't boiling over, nor going cold. A warm love, unquote. I'm just saying, there are a ton more examples I found, but those are probably the two most notable, where whether or not they intended to hint at their future concept, it just goes to show that this really is all 17, that they are hands-on, and this truly is their story as they want to tell it. Who they are, out of the music videos, off stage, I guess you could say, is who they are on stage. Good transition into talking about number 15. There are two sons in the hot video, in Highlight Medley and stuff, two sons for this comeback. One looks real. One is clearly like for a school play. Like it is something for a stage production, a handmade craft project. I bring this up because, as I've said before on the show, Seventeen always do have references to camera work, to this being a movie they're filming, or a play, this theatrical element of the story. In Happy Ending, The Ticket Booth, and Clap, lots of times where they allude to this is all one big stage production, a show within a show, a show within the music video. And they seem to subtly keep that a through line for this comeback by having a fake son as well as the real one. Number 16. One of the main messages they reiterated in the press conference is their theme of happiness is a journey, not a destination. So allow me to reread that part of their their Instagram story teaser content where they talk about happiness is a journey. Quote, I want to surprise everyone. I want to show you what I can become. Happiness is a journey, not a destination. Vivid and agile, luminous and rough, high and wide, dark and dazzling. There we go. Even if my two eyes are blind, I will face the sun. I'm not afraid of the unknown world because the strong and brilliant beings will always be with me, like a diamond that can't be scratched." Unquote. And this comeback theme really is about that, facing the sun, facing your fears, and then letting your passion burn as bright as the sun, getting rid of your old shell, and becoming a newly confident, bold version of yourself. Which brings me to number 17 on the list. Book nerds assemble. I am so excited that they did this. They have a song called Don Quixote. We have to talk about that crazy book. It's so good. But I'll give you the Spark Notes version, basically. The Hope Notes version. Because it actually makes a whole lot of sense why Seventeen chose that character. Don Quixote is a Spanish epic novel. It was originally published as part one, which is 52 chapters, and then part two, 10 years later, 74 chapters. It's a super rambling story. It's kind of episodic, so you could probably read part two, and it would make as much sense, or nonsense rather, as part one. Usually they're considered just one big book today, but back in the 1600s, it was part one and part two. It is considered the first modern novel that inspired everything after it. And it really did, if you're into reading classics, you probably know how it laid this blueprint for everyone else. And it really just did things, character development-wise, that were unprecedented. Truly, I cannot overstate this story's impact. And it is one of the most translated books of all time, too. It's endlessly fascinating because the read on it shifts as society does. So some generations have labeled it a comedy. Others label it more of just a medieval drama. Others view it as social commentary. But no one can ever agree on what genre it belongs in or who the social commentary is actually directed at. Is it us or is it him? Let's think about that classic Spongebob episode where he thinks he's helping the town as the hall monitor of the whole town and he just makes things worse for everybody. He's like, I'm gonna save the car stuck in traffic and he causes a car crash and he says, I'm going to make sure these people know the dangers of leaving their window open. So he jumps through the window. That energy of, oh my gosh, I'm the maniac? Once he realizes he's the wanted maniac, he's really shook up. Like, what? Because the whole time he was trying to find the maniac. Anyway, it's a great episode. Such a classic. Definitely the same energy here, where Don Quixote is trying to help people, and he keeps making it worse, but walks away like, took care of that. He tries to interfere to stop bullying, but the second he leaves the scene, the bullying resumes. He tries to treat people's wounds with miracle cures of his, which just make their symptoms worse. Stuff like that. Don Quixote is his pseudonym. 
He's actually Alonso, who's just called the son of something. And he becomes so obsessed with reading books that they're considered to have, like, dried his brain out. So his fried brain has made it so that he doesn't know what's fiction versus reality anymore. So he seeks out to become the knight that he read about in his book. So he rebrands himself to live life as the character he read about. At one point, he actually attends the funeral of a guy who left school to become a shepherd after reading about a shepherd in a book, so a total lack of self-awareness when he went to that. The reader is meant to stay confused, just like he is, about how much he believes himself. Like, is this all an act? Does he really know deep down he's not a knight? He's not this fantastic hero? He's just a guy messing with people? Or is he really believing this? And you're not supposed to know for certain as the reader. Especially because it's an interesting constant contrast with Sancho, his sidekick basically, who is the epitome of more pragmatism compared to his idealism. So this yin and yang effect. And no character is trustworthy. Everyone's unreliable as a source, so as they go on these adventures meeting all of these side characters, you don't know what stories are at least rooted in a kernel of truth or what the character totally is bluffing about. Are they humoring him? Or do they believe his fantasies too? Or are they made up in his head? What's going on? There's this really funny scene where a priest, Quixote's niece, and the housekeeper try to burn all of his books while Quixote is unconscious. Later, they just say a wizard did it. They know he's gullible, whatever. But as they burn the books, they debate why they should burn them. And clearly, they've either read these books or haven't. But either way, you can see how the scene is just this absurd social commentary about censorship. Because these people, if they haven't read the books, why are you jumping to the conclusion, let's just burn it, it's dangerous. And then if you have, you seem fine. Because remember, this is a priest in this scene who's like, these books will taint your brain. And they include all these immoral things like, and he gets very specific. So clearly he's read it. It's quite a commentary. In the end, Quixote had actually had an arrest warrant out for him since he freed some slaves. Yeah, it's a long story. He does get caught and put in a cage. But he believes and fantasizes that this is just part of the plan. This is part of the prophecy. He was meant to travel back home via cage where he will have a hero's welcome and where he will just be treated like the superhero he is. And the narrator in this story ends with a comment about, oh, he did go on other adventures, but the records are lost. The narrator actually is adding even more confusion to this story by inserting himself in a way and making it sound like he is aware how this looks and how every time he makes Quixote do something, it's also his personal bid to get some fame and attention from him. Like he's acknowledging, look, I'm living vicariously through him. Whether the him refers to Alonso or Quixote is also up to interpretation. There are some reasons why this story honestly brings to mind Seventeen's story. First of all, there is that cage. Second of all, there's actually a scene where, this is probably coincidence, but still an interesting connection. There's a scene where they're at the inn and they pull a prank on Sancho that involves wrapping him up in a blanket and tossing him high in the air, like in the left and right video. There's also a big key scene in a forest. The forest has come to be a big important key setting in Seventeen's story. There's also this character called the Knight of the Mirrors, aka Knight of the Forest, aka Knight of the White Moon. And White Knight was the name of Asku's teaser video. And again, the forest symbolism. And actually mirrors too have been a symbol for Seventeen before. So yeah, it's all there, whichever nickname you use. That character is really interesting because he's meant to be a mirror to Quixote because Quixote is the opposite of self-aware and so the mirror character is supposed to kind of get him to be more self-aware of how he comes across to others. It obviously doesn't work, but it's an interesting battle scene. I also feel like it makes sense because honestly, I know this is coincidental, but Seventeen have had a lot of songs like Clap about just not letting the small stuff get you down, learning to brush things off. This book actually is where the phrase tilting at windmills comes from. If someone says like, you're tilting at windmills, that means like you're, you're attacking an imagined enemy or a non-existent issue. Some might say book banners are tilting at windmills. 
They're going after the wrong things, not putting energy in the right place, that kind of thing. There are also times in their newer teaser content where there could be a parallel. Like in Vernon's new Instagram story teaser, he said, quote, can a fish swim if it knows it's in a fish tank? And then Dino's teaser said, quote, even my existence ends up as a rumor. Then recall in the Your Choice trailer, there were the words, saw you in my arms, it felt so real. And the words, saw you in my dreams. So that questioning what's real goes back to Seventeen's work, and of course to their whole putting on a show concept too. Other themes, where there could be some overlap, the main character feeling out of place no matter what, the inability to get a clear, concrete answer, a never-ending journey, the conflicting desires and thoughts people hold, the different identities they hold, how each individual does kind of create and inhabit their own reality. If you want to get really nerdy and scholarly, which you know I do, this book has also been interpreted to be kind of a rebuttal to Freudian views, where Freud thought about human behavior as being primarily subconscious. He's the one who came up with the id, ego, and superego distinctions. He thought actually our ideal state is to develop our egos to the point the id-based drives can be carried out in socially acceptable ways. But Freud clashed with this author's take on the world, so that's a whole other realm of discussion you could enter. I'm sorry, I'm nerding out. Please let me share just two more anecdotes from Don Quixote. One is that there's a scene where he talks about the golden age, a time when humans were more with the natural world and there was no need for a knighthood because everyone was just so peaceful together and got along. There was no need for authority, for a hierarchy, for an organization to, in their minds, keep the peace because it was already there. This is a ramble no one listens to. They all either fall asleep or clearly have no idea what he's talking about. They have no interest in that ideal world, which leaves a lot to think about. As well as the fact that he's not self-aware, yet he's acknowledging his knighthood status may not be necessary. Then there's the story of the man too curious for his own good, where he becomes so intent to prove something happened that he never seeks out to just find out what happened. He's so focused on getting a very specific truth in proof for that truth that he never finds out what really happened. And his last words are, quote, a foolish and ill-advised curiosity has robbed me of my life, unquote. And that's extra interesting in the story context because Quixote is the opposite. He would never do what the character in the story within a story does. That character looked for solid, tangible proof, and that was how he thought you get to a truth. Quixote, in his fantasy world, thinks you get to a truth through thinking it up, through making it up, and really, in some ways, he's more right than you think about how we all kind of do inhabit our own reality, our own determined reality. We set our own parameters for what we know and don't. Really interesting tie-in, and maybe they listen to the show, you never know. Because lately I've been talking about the gray men and books that have inspired artists, so this is a lovely addition to that list. I have a lot more to say about each song on this album, in the music video, but I'm saving it for my review and future episodes. Stay tuned, make sure you're subscribed, howtostand.substack.com. In the coming days I will have my full album review out, and I will continue to release editions of my 17 essay series, breaking down their discography and interpreting it from different angles with each essay. The last one was kind of philosophical, meets grammatical and technical. Anyway, check it out, please. I work hard on those. They're free posts. And much more to cover from different artists. Lots I'm working on. Thank you guys, as always, so much for listening, and I will talk to you all again very soon. Bye, everybody.